Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar that's part of the Kinexus Continuous Improvement Series. I'm Mark Raven from Kinexus. I'm really excited. We've got a webinar today titled Adaptive Design Kata, an Improvement and a Leadership Kata. And we're joined today, I'll introduce him uh, a little bit more in a minute, uh, by Dr. John Kanegi from Kanegi and Associates. And just a, a quick story on um, the last webinar in our series that was being presented also by a physician, Dr. Joy Dobson uh, from Saskatchewan. Um, I saw in the, in the list of attendees, I saw the name John Kanegi, and I was happy to find out later, uh, was, from my perspective, is the John Kanegi. Um, I have a copy. I've had this book for more than a decade. The, the book you see him holding in his picture um, called Design to Adapt. It's marked up. It's got pages dog-eared. Um, I've really enjoyed that book. And so then uh, John in the, the follow-up survey, made a comment about he'd be willing to share some things. And so I was really excited about that. And we've had a couple of great conversations. And I know today's webinar is going to be really um, unique and helpful and thought-provoking. So I'm really excited um, that we're doing this today. Let me more formally introduce our presenter today, um, Dr. John Kanegi. Um, Dr. Kanegi knows healthcare from many different perspectives, as a vascular surgeon, as an executive, as an academic researcher, an author, and an innovator. Um, but his most meaningful experience that influenced him was as a patient following a critical injury, and you'll hear a little bit about that today. And John discovered that his survival depended on, as he put it, the efforts of dedicated, highly trained individuals working in an unpredictable, conflicted system, the current healthcare environment. So as a visiting scholar at the Harvard Business School, John's research translated leading indicator systems from resilient companies like Toyota, Intel, Apple, and Amazon into healthcare. He studied with legendary names, including Steve Spear and Kent Bowen and the late Clayton Christensen. And um, John's discovery through all this work is that our, our solutions are designed to adapt and um, having these, these katas or routines or systems um, that affect leadership and the point of care um, are um, greatly needed. And I think what John's going to share today um, is going to help, help us move forward, whether we work in healthcare or not. So um, I think there's a lot that's going to be helpful to leaders in, in different settings. Um, so with that, John, thank you again so much for being here. I'm going to turn things over to you. Well, Thanks, Mark, and, uh, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, today, I'm going to share some insights on Toyota and innovation that I discovered working uh, at Harvard Business School, as, as, uh, as you mentioned, Mark. And I really want to emphasize uh, uh, Steve Spear and Kent Bowen's Harvard Business Review paper, The DNA of the Toyota Production System. It was really fundamental to my learning, and I believe it is essential to any true understanding of the Toyota production system. People at Toyota truly say, this is our DNA. As part of my learning, uh, I had lunch with uh, Hajim Oba. Mr. Oba is the head of the Toyota, was the head of the Toyota System Support Center. And he's a, he's a legendary figure in the development of Toyota in America. And I jumped at the chance to have that lunch. I found him a very gentlemanly, easy person to talk with, and he asked me many questions about my work. Then midway through lunch, he looked directly at me, and he said, would you like to know the secret of the Toyota production system? I gulped and started looking around for a pen and pa paper as he began by holding his hands out in front of him like this. And he said, all the other consultants and managers implement solutions down on the people doing the work. What they don't understand is the work always changes in unpredictable, even unknowable ways underneath them. And then he held his hands out like this and he said, Toyota is different. First, we develop the people and everything flows from that. So, is that an insight into improving complex organizations? So, Mr. Ober was talking about Toyota as a complex adaptive manufacturing organization. Today, I will use healthcare as an example, but as you will see, everything I'm presenting 
fits complex systems in any business. So what's an insight? We've all had them. An insight occurs when we've been looking at something for a long time, maybe years, and then suddenly we look at it from a different angle or perspective, and we see things we hadn't seen before. We say, well, that's an insight. So we're going to use Mr. Oba's perspective to gain insights into our own work. Have a pen or pencil and a piece of paper with you. And I want you to write down kata one and kata two as the headers on two separate columns on a piece of paper. I'm going to show you examples of managed care kata systems. And then ask you to look at those katas through Mr. Oba's eyes. Is what you're... Is what kata one implementing data-driven solutions into complex work? If so, make a mark under the implementing data-driven solutions in complex work kata one column. Or is it Mr. Oba's Toyota kata, developing people in complex work so that everything flows from that? Just make a mark under the kata two kata. This is not a test. Your responses are yours. So don't overthink it. Just mark what comes to mind. Kata one or kata two. So to start, let's agree on some definitions. Although much of my adaptive design work grew from Toyota, I don't use traditional lean or Japanese terms simply because many people don't understand them. But I am intrigued by kata methods. I believe they create a great opportunity. So for the purpose of this webinar, here are my definitions of those terms as I understand them. First, kata means system. Toyota kata is a Kaizen system. In other words, a continuous improvement system developed by. This improvement system is based on the scientific method. How? All improvements are made as experiments, as close in time and place to the work as possible. And all improvement is very Toyota-esque. It's low cost, low risk, high reward, and fast. Leadership develops, improves, and validates kata success, and then replicates and, and scales that success, trust, and optimism. That's the framework that we're working in this chart. So I'm going to start by looking at healthcare kata. We're going to get some healthcare kata insights. And so what's our managed care kata? We started managing care way back here in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, because the reason was uh, uh, U.S. healthcare was more expensive than the rest of the developed world. See here? It's in red, more expensive. Healthcare was a cottage industry then, and experts believed we could lower costs and increase quality by better managing. Something else happened about that same time. I started into practice, and our surgical group was approached by Kaiser Permanente to provide care for their patients. The Kaiser business model was not fee-for-service. It was capitation, a flat fee for surgical care based on the number of their contracted patients. We decided to do it, and it was very successful for all because Kaiser got predictable cost and really good quality, and because because we were more efficient than Kaiser, we could do what we wanted to do, which was take care of patients and do it profitably. The contract lasted for 24 years and was one of the first examples of an accountable care organization, an ACO. At the start, as far as costs generally in the first few years, uh, managed care raised costs, but we all thought that was temporary and it was the right thing to do. So we continued. Then in 1982, something new happened. I fell out of a tree and broke my neck. So what's a doctor look like with a broken neck? Here you have the typical doctor with a broken neck. So I learned a lot from that experience, not just from the journals. I finally had the time to read. I was totally disabled for six months. And beyond journals, I had nothing to do but watch what was going on around me. I had many wonderful things happen to me. I made a complete recovery with no disability. But what I saw was that many of those wonderful things 
came to me on the back of an individual going the extra mile to make sure I got what I needed, not necessarily what the system was delivering to me. And it also became perfectly clear that the system in and of itself could clearly get in their way of getting me what I needed. That experience really changed my thinking. What if the system made it easy for people to get what they needed? <laughs> that just made so much sense to me. So if we're gonna manage care, we need clinicians to, cl cl clinicians to be part of management. So I decided to do it. To become a manager, you have to join one of these. So I did. I took on progressively bigger roles, chief of surgery, chief of staff, finally a regional vice president for business development. At the same time, with great support from both my partners and our hospital, I continued to work down at the front line as a surgeon. So how do you manage care? Care, all the care is down here at the front line. And we do marvelous, wonderful, amazing things in healthcare, but sometimes things just go awry. Unexpected problems occur. We have a sentinel event that we're not hitting budget. So how does management know what to do? Well, we need data. And we were constantly looking for new and better data about care and operations. In addition, financial information was extremely important. As Mother Teresa, now St. Teresa said, no money, no mission. In addition, healthcare is very complex, so we depended on outside consultants and smart, experienced people with ideas and new technology to make a difference. Then we took all that data and we analyzed, planned, and predicted, alone in our offices or more commonly in meetings. We had lots of meetings because these were complex problems without easy answers. Finally, we made decisions, which we implemented back into the system. You know, we were pioneers in this work, but there was a growing body of information about managed care. And we carefully selected the best practices that made the most sense to our organization. So here's what we did in 1994. Might have a little problem seeing that. Oh, but uh, we did implement electronic health records and uh, new data systems. That was very important to us. Take a look at the rest of this list. Now, I want you to think about it. I want you to decide how would Mr. Oba rate this first managed care kata? Is it a kata one? Is it data-driven implementation? Or is it a kata two? Is it a developed people kata? So make a mark under the, important, uh, under the uh, appropriate column. So what would Mastroba think? What do you think? Well, now we go to 1998. I'm as the executive doctor combination. And we had bent the cost curve. See here a little bit? We would bent the cost curve a little bit, but we had two problems. First, managed care was not popular with many patients and caregivers. And very importantly, it was also not profitable. Every large managed care system on the West Coast, including Kaiser and our group and our organization struggled with profitability. So we needed to improve our kata to solve the profitability problem. How? Well, we had to continue our managed care best practices, no doubt about that, but you can't run a unprofitable business. We needed to increase revenue and cut costs. When the going gets tough, the tough get going, and we got tough with our biggest variable cost, people, and we actually did the first layoffs in the memory of anyone at our hospital. Wow, we increased pressure to hit our numbers. Now, what would Mr. Oba think about this kata, 1998 now? So rate this number one, more implemented solutions, or two, are we developing people? Personally, I had different questions. I wondered how we managers could get more data up fast enough to analyze and implement quick enough to be effective in our unpredictable workplaces. And secondly, I was part of our corporate automated systems leadership team and the electronic health record I proudly helped implement, gave me information I didn't need, made it harder for me to get the information I needed, and it clearly slowed me up. 
I couldn't meet my own needs, either as a clinician or a manager. And I was the same person. So I left. I decided to take a brief, what I thought was going to be a brief sabbatical to figure it out. More about that in a few minutes. So how did these efforts in 1998 work? Think about it. Are we a kata one or a kata two in 1998? Make your choice and let's go closer to the closer to where we are at right now. So now we go to 1998. Oh, one other problem I meant to mention, we can track this cost issue going forward. And uh, you all know this story. Uh, costs have steadily progressed up to the present day, and actually they're going to go up six and a half percent next year, or this year, they're estimated to go up. But we failed, managed care has failed to control the cost problem. I mean, we just, at least that's the way I look at it. I don't know how you look at it. What do you think? So let's get closer to the present day. So we're 20 years later now in 2018. We need some help. And uh, the government is always there to help us. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, here we are going to roll out a bold new patient-focused approach to, to healthcare. And here's Alex Azar, the head of HHS, announcing what's that going to be. Well, what's it look like? Well, let's look at the CADA in 2018. We're going to improve those electronic health records, and we're going to have larger uh, uh, in, uh, IDSs. We are going to attack pharmacy. Man, we're going to get that right now. We use lean and all and six sigma and a whole bunch of other things to improve. We are paying for, we want to pay for value. And CMS is really pushing the ACO market. Population health, definitely important. We're going to help patients shop for, for care by price transparency and uh, clinical pathways and social determinants of care are now really important. And you get the rest of the story down here. Um, what do you think? Well, let's is that uh, is that uh, let's take it to where we are now. What's the kata in 2021? You know, actually, it's the same with variations. We definitely have a stronger emphasis on uh, social determinants of care and racial disparities are definitely recognized as a problem, but they're otherwise all the same. What's different? Initial gover governmental initiatives now are we gotta we gotta we gotta we gotta do something about that cost. We need up the Affordable Care Act. We need healthcare equity. So we're gonna lower Medicare. We're gonna uh, we're gonna ex uh, expand ACA premium subsidies. But there's one other thing that's going on. By the same time. Uh, the Congressional bu Budget Office uh, predicts Medicare will be insolvent in 24-26. So how are we doing with Mr. Oba? What's he think? What's he think? What's he think is going on here? And uh, is this, are we still with a Kata 1 or is this potentially a Kata 2? Well, let's take a look and see. Uh, um, what are we gonna do going forward? These are very difficult times, but difficult times are also times of great opportunity. I believe this is one of the greatest opportunities in the history of healthcare, actually improving quality while we simultaneously lower the cost of care. I propose we have two options. We can continue to try harder. We've been trying harder for a long time and we can keep doing that. The problem is there is an abundance of evidence from many sources us trying harder is not the answer. For example, you can see the evidence almost daily in the news media. Here's what I don't understand. You just asked me to follow a process that's failed 30 times in a row and you know it. At what point can this no longer be called optimism? When it succeeds. I don't think that's our answer. But if we don't try harder, what's our answer? How about something along Mr. Oba's line? What do you think about this? What if we had a leadership and improvement kata that developed people? Well, it seems to make some sense. So how would we do it? 
So here's a kata strategy that's proven to work and it's low cost, low risk, high reward and fast. It's also logical. Do we want more of kata one or do we want a kata two that does this? I present this slide all the time and everybody in the audience will pick kata two, but then walk out the door and do kata one. I had to learn a chance to learn more about this problem when uh, with Clayton Christensen uh, as a visiting scholar with him. And uh, the result was this article that we wrote in Harvard Business Review. The problem is established successful organizations develop a kata that's great at improving what they know how to do, but finds it almost impossible to do what they don't know how to do. That's innovate. But instead of studying all the thousands of organizations that didn't innovate, I decided to study the few who actually created a kata two from a kata one. Here's who I studied. So the question is, do you wanna be on this list? If the answer is yes, you have to make some choices. So I'm gonna help and there's a secret sauce. So here's what I mean. Kata one systems are data-driven systems. We know data being data driven is important. It developed in the industrial revolution and uh, they're necessary and you'll never stop being data driven. But in business history, it's also very clear that the innovators use a different system. They use value to drive data. Every successful startup has to start that way. Why? Because there's no data on something that's truly new. And all the great innovations that change injuries come come from there. So here's the uh, secret sauce. It's not either or, it's and. The successful innovators create opportunities in their organizations where they can center on value. You're not gonna stop using data to drive value, but you're gonna create places that Create that, that develop value that drives the data. So next we'll explore a, a kata that has that secret sauce. And Mr. Oba's thinking is right there. I'm gonna start by developing the business case. A kata one is different than kata two, so why should we do something different? The answer is because doing something different is works. So what are the results that make the business case? Say you wanted to improve quality, quality in a surgical operating room. The quality improvement language may vary, but in Kata 1, we'd use data to decide where we should focus in our efforts for maximum benefits in one or more of these areas. And then uh, do demand, measure, analyze, do PDSA cycles or in implement Jakota, and then standardize the work, followed by more data to audit and control the work in the future. Sound right? So here's what happened in one of the first places we did adaptive design, the operating room of a large Northeast urban unionized teaching hospital. What'd we do? First, we had the same areas of, oppor of opportunity as in the previous slide, but we centered them on the patient and then used relevant information and simple rules to enable work-based innovation to improve as an A3 experiment not as a project or event. Here's our A3 symbol. And they did, and A3s in this work are different oftentimes than what we see in Kata 1. If we have time today, I can show you one. In six months, they completed 59 A3s. This is, a, again, very early in our work and, and we can work much faster now. Every time they finished an A3, we had them chart which of the four improvement areas were affected by placing the A3 symbol. This is what they discovered. Starting with the patient, not the classification of the problem, almost all the improvements had multi-dimensional effects. The financial result was measured by finance doing a net present value on each A3. The total dollar savings were $1,672,000. And all but one of those financial improvements affected another key indicator. Here's another key to success. Improving surgical volume or decreasing staff over time was never a focus for any of the 59 A3s. 
But at the end of six months, we discovered surgical volume had increased 14% while staff overtime had decreased 12%. We were assured that had never happened before in the memory of anyone in the OR. And that brings us to a key discovery. It's Goodhart's Law, and it's very real. If you haven't heard of it, look it up on Wikipedia. When a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be a good metric. We don't focus on the numbers. We focus on developing systems that drive the numbers. What's your Mr. Oba rating here? Is this a kata one or kata two thinking? But we have to improve our numbers, right? Well, here's the basis, business case for developing people. This is a Midwestern community hospital. They focused on nursing and picked a poorly performing nursing unit as the place they'd started at the design. Here's the effect on their low performing HCAPs. This one is very interesting. The, the hospitalists did not want to participate, the doctors, because uh, they were overworked and, and uh, they felt stressed and they just didn't want to do anything with this crazy stuff. But in the eyes of the patients, they became much better communicators. It's the system that makes a difference. The doctors changed their minds when they saw these results. The fact is healthcare is not a machine, but rather they're a complex adaptive system, and that's why Mr. Oba's approach is effective. If you're interested in complexity theory or complex systems, let me know. We can talk a lot about it. But what about the dollars? Profitability is a lagging indicator that always follows. This hospital used a balanced financial results, and this unit went from the lowest to the highest scorecard. So, well, so what are we going to do here? I can give you many more examples. Adaptive design never fails. The opportunity is a different kata. That's essential. And it's a leadership kata that has to link with the innovation kata. It's not two separate katas. So uh, here's why I put the, the, the it's, it's very important to have leadership standards to develop a sustainable culture of success in an organization. And here are the standards that not just me, but many people have identified as key to organizations becoming successful innovators. They're not standard work. Instead, they provide guidance for people making a change or innovating. They're the rules of the road. I'm not going to go through them individually, but rather I'm just going to give you an example of how these standards are uh, employed in a case study. Here's a great U.S. health system. It's, they're synonymous with quality and excellence. They're totally committed to doing the best and improving uh, population health was very important for them. But for months, despite their best efforts, outcomes improved only modestly in these two groups. Uh, uh, this is a great issue and everyone wanted to improve population health. Management, physician, staff, IT, patients, contracting, quality, consultants, the whole system. But despite all those great resources, the, the, the system failed to produce. So people say the system's broken, but I will guarantee you that this system is not broken. So why couldn't they improve population health? Paul Batalden put it best. Systems are not broken. Every system, think Kata, is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Is that true? Is that an insight? Well, let's see what we can see from this example. Uh, suddenly, one of the groups started rapid improvement and made dramatic improvement over the over the next over the next year. What do you think caused that? Do you think Mr. Oba would be interested in what went on? The other thing that's interesting is the improvements did not did not start here. They started back here. And something happened in this three month cycle that drove those improvements. Another very important uh, point here is population health is a lagging indicator. And you can't use lagging indicators to manage really complex 
constantly changing, improve, improving work. You can't, you, can't, you can't depend on population health or length of stay or readmits or profitability to, dis, to decide what to do now in an unpredictable environment. So the traditional consulting role transitions into coaching and support. Coaches don't produce solutions. They develop many people to never stop producing solutions in complex environments. That's our framework. And that becomes an increasingly important role for leadership. You have help in that. So there's this, all this work has been documented very clearly over a long period of time. We use this book as a textbook very actively. We have an online learning system that enables the frontline to be able to do this effectively. Uh, and right now I'm looking to write the leadership book and actually do the leadership uh, um, technology part that goes along with this. And I'm looking for people who are interested in, in discovery. Let me know if you're interested. So here's how it works. Leadership makes choices. Great leaders make choices and their kata guides them to make the right choices. So here's our population health graph superimposed over a a graph I learned about from Dr. Sam Stanton. Sam was a Naval Intelligence Operative in the Iraq War before he became a physician. This graph is adapted from the leading indicators of success the military used to, tra to transition from command and control to adaptive operations necessary in, in a war in which the enemy could be anyone. We start in the current system. And we make no assumptions. It's not good or bad. It's just the current system. Then we start to apply the leadership standards I just presented. We assist leadership in developing a clear, consistent objective, like Toyota's North Star or the commander's intent in military parlance. And they also discover how they will develop people in teams to do this scientifically. Top execs must participate. Then there's an essential step. They start to simplify and coordinate by, deci by deciding where and what they want to improve. Innovation never starts as a huge project. This is easier in an independent hospital than a large corporate system, but definitely system leadership can do this. If they engage, they just have to identify a small place in their organization to start. As Toyota says, you cannot know until you see, you cannot see until you do. The next choice is deciding what they're gonna do. And this organization decided they were going to improve inpatient care. So the next step is discovery down here in the current system. And that in our work is a two to three day, very low risk, low cost, high reward learning kata based on relevant information, taking them right exactly from where we started, and simple rules. So everybody's experiencing this as, they're, they, as, they are moving, as they are moving forward. What we start with is we go out and discover from the experts what, what, what we're doing in the work. That shows leadership the power of an essential Kata 2 skill set, direct op observation. Leaders go to the front line or the gemba, if you prefer, to have a nurse teach us what they do by simply allowing them, allowing us to observe, watch, and diagnose their work. So this is what we, and this is what we always see. This is just an example. Uh, this was a, a, a nurse, Jess. Uh, in one hour, she was delivering her, her meds. This was a, this is the standard process, right? I mean, it's med administration. Chunk, 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 chunk to ideally meet the med administration needs and other needs of her five patients in an hour. She worked in 34 locations, changed the location 103 times. To meet the needs of five patients, ideally in one hour, she talked with 17 different people on greater than 100 subjects. It's amazing the information that can be exchanged. These very talented nurses. And uh, how did she spend her time? She spent 23 minutes of her time in direct patient care, 21% of her time in admin and 
what's that's what we want a nurse to do. So we call everything else a workaround or in a perfect system, she wouldn't do it. It's a small system failure. So we do a few more observations. It's very simple, it takes an hour, and maybe we find this average. So what do we want your nurse to do? What, what do you in a hospital want your nurse to do? Think about it. So this is a huge opportunity. And uh, an article by Anita Tucker from Harvard and Wharton uh, studied nurse workarounds. Uh, and I want you to write this number down. Nurse workarounds cost $95 per nurse per hour. Write that down. And then I want you to do the computation on your hospital. We have some real opportunities here. So what, how, how are we gonna do something about it? Leadership now has a choice. They've got new information. We make, they make binary choices. We say, this is yes, or this is no. Is it gonna be, if they say no to us, we just, you know, they say, well, we're gonna continue our current work. We like our best practices. We learned a lot here. This is great, but no, that's great for us. <laughs> we don't waste our time. We just move on. If they say, yes, there might be something here. We give them the information they need to start the first step, simplicate, simplif is, is in, in simplification, starting here, and here's our time frame. It's simpl simplification is uh, 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 the simplification toolbox. Uh, we then uh, also engage people in the organization in doing this. We, they, we call them learner leader teachers. The key to in adaptive design success is we don't make improvements as consultants, we teach. We coach and develop people inside the organization to do the work. That leads to the next leading indicator, the coordinated toolbox, and starts to develop internal problem solving teams throughout the organization. You just keep repeating what you now know how to do. And you can get better and better at it as you moved into the collaborative toolbox and finally to synchronized adaptive care. Is this an improvement, Kata? Is this Kata one implementation or is the Kata two developing people? Make your toy choice. Because the exciting thing that happens is people get really engaged. They don't have to be told this is working. They can, and the result for the system is rapidly improving progress. I'm gonna go through, go forward so we can get to our questions here quickly. I can give you, a, I can give you another example, but I don't have to give you another example. You know, there, there's plenty of examples of how this works as we go forward. Um, here's the key, a key point. This is really important. It's the leadership part of this work and each one of these toolboxes has specific method skills and tools attached to them that are measurable. So the role of leadership is now to, not to make new solutions, not, not to implement the solutions, but validate, replicate and scale that success. And we're now working on a new technology point to do this and we're looking for partners who want to join us in this. This is how it works. The problem to solve is not in, in, uh, innovation, but that isolated distant leadership do not have relevant actionable information about what's happening now. That's a great opportunity. It's low cost, low risk, and it's a new Kata 2 opportunity. Each of the leading indicators, as I said, is measurable. So you can attach very simple technology to uh, give actionable information to even decision makers in weeks. Uh, sorry, we got on to the wrong slide here. In, um, in, 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 in weeks, your first unit is going to be moving from simplified to coordinated. You can measure that. That gives senior executives the information they need to say, hey, this is working, let's start, let's start in two more units. So 
progress is very predictable as long as you can see the progress happening. Well, yeah, we ought to continue to do this, particularly when you see or parts of your organization moving into now st standardized adaptive care. And that makes it easy to make, let's replicate and scale now again. You're not doing this to audit. You're only doing it to find this. It works. You only have to find out when it's not working. And that is when leadership needs, okay, what's going on? How can we use science to understand what's happening in this unit as we go forward? That's, I'm going to uh, uh, end very quickly with this and we'll go to questions. So it's a step-by-step -step approach. D discover, develop, deliver, move from simplified to coordinated. It's a direct natural extension of what you're currently, doggone it, sorry about that again. The wandering button got me. And that takes you to a collaborative place and you're multiplying the value of people, resources, cash, and technology. That's key. That takes you to synchronized adaptive and now leadership and management have the data to replicate and scale that success. It's a kata empowerment equation. So I will end and go to announcements. Sorry, I ran over there a little bit. Uh, I, no, uh, John, I think- But I got excited. This is a I, fun talk. I, I, think, I think you brought the plane in uh, to land right on time. So that's, <laughs> that's fine. Thank you for everything that you shared today. And I encourage people uh, to continue submitting questions. And while we give a little bit more time for that, let me make a few quick announcements. You can advance that, please. We've, uh, John, we've got upcoming webinars. Um, if you are a Kinexus customer, the next training team office hours with Adam and Noah is going to be held next week, June 24th. You can register for that at kinexus.com slash webinars. Um, our next presentation style webinar, um, it's going to be, well, we've had quite a streak of uh, physicians presenting here. Uh, it's going to be our own Dr. Greg Jacobson, uh, co-founder and CEO of Kinexus, speaking about um, Kaizen or continuous improvement and physician engagement. Uh, we're still working out the details on this. We may have a special executive guest from um, a healthcare system, but the tentative date for this is June 29th. And these presentation webinars are open to all. You can sign up to get notified via email when new webinars are open for registration. There's a, a link again at kinexus.com slash webinars. I'll tell you about a few other things. If you can, next slide, please. We have other resources. You can find well over a hundred uh, recorded webinars from uh, going back six or seven years. Um, you can find that library at kinexus.com slash webinars. You can also find all of those recordings if you prefer on our YouTube channel. We would love for you to subscribe and sign up for notifications on the Kinexus YouTube channel. We invite you to also check out our blog at blog.kinexus.com. Um, today's session will become, of course, part of that webinar library. And then next slide, please. We also have a podcast and the audio from today's session will appear in the podcast feed. You can find that. You can get more information at kinexus.com slash podcast. You can subscribe in all of um, the typical uh, podcast apps or services that you might use. Um, so with that, we have time for Q&A and we'll have, people, uh, we'll have uh, contact information on screen here, uh, including um, John's firm, Canadian Associates. You, um, if you can advance that, there we go. We'll see canadianassociates.com. We encourage you to um, learn more and you can see our social media um, contact there. Um, so there's a couple questions that um, are, are similar. If you can maybe go backward to the- Go back here, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry. So a couple of questions while, while you're doing that. Um, you, at one point, you stated, John, um, that top executives must participate. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. And there's another question that just asks, um, how is leadership engaged? 
my experience, and I think maybe this was your point, but there's a chance for you to elaborate on this. Um, Tim says, my experience has been that they support more so than participating. Um, I see a lot of that as well. What, what, what do you mean uh, and, and how do or how should top executives participate in this kind of improvement? Yeah, that's a great point. And, it's, and it is really important. Uh, the, the, the standards, you know, good, good leaders will support you. They'll be, they'll be really uh, uh, engaged and they'll wanna do the right thing. Uh, and they'll say, give me the data. And uh, if we need to change our mind, I will change our mind. The problem is it's a deeply embedded human. Uh, and a, a, lot of, a lot of this is based on human neurophysiology, which has been a big part of my research. That is necessary, but insufficient to change people's minds. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we don't think our ways to new way of acting. We act our ways to new way of thinking. So we want to give leadership that opportunity very specifically and very focused on the, on the areas in which they need to be able to make decisions. So they actually become part of innovation teams. We actually may, may draw in, uh, A3s, and we do draw A3s to help solve their problems. So, and, and they don't have a lot of time. They do not have a lot of time. So what we wanna do is design our, uh, our, our involvement and our engagement with them very specifically. That's why the discovery to decide to do this is very short, it's two to three days, boom. Low cost, low risk, high reward, fast. What I wanna do with the technology uh, going forward is this work always works, I can guarantee it. But now we can start to get relevant information to people who are distant from the learning line so that they can see their part. And they can also start to see where they're part of the problem. That gets to be crucial in doing this work. So it's designing it, but we're gonna start from the, we're gonna start from the front line and design up with their help going down, just like Mr. Oba. Leaders finding out or discovering that they're part of the problem is really uncomfortable is maybe my big understatement, um, the biggest understatement that I could uh, say out loud today. Um, telling them that they're part of the problem, probably completely ineffective, that coming back to the way our brains work and you'll just breed defensiveness. Um, could, could you just elaborate a little bit more on like the, this process or maybe you can think of an example of another executive who came <laughs> to realize this on their own through designed practice of, of getting involved in improvement, looking at systems. This is really hard for, uh, for an executive to come to terms with, right? Well, actually, the problem-solving method helps solve that because what we're going to start with is um, we're not going to start with, you know, we're not going to improve. Um, uh, well, I'll give you the example. Uh, when we start this work on the learning line, uh, the people who learn it, the learner leader teachers, they learn to observe and everybody discovers exactly the same thing. You know, it's a very chaotic the workarounds are every place. Mm -hmm. And once everybody sees that, they experience it, but we make sure senior leadership is seeing it at the same time. We never tie in a solution to an observation. It's only creating our picture of where we're at. Now the staff is all ready to have somebody smart in a, in a coat and tie come in and tell them how to work harder. So, but the way we start is we say, just tell us staff the next time you don't have what you need to meet patient care needs ideally. And it generally takes about a nanosecond. The last place we worked, a CNA just held up her hand and said, well, the ED just admitted a patient to my room and the room's not ready and I didn't know. Mm -hmm. That becomes the problem that you solve and you start there, but you extend that as high in the organization as it needs to go. So you need to perhaps pull in and they actually did need to include the emergency department, the emergency director, everybody in solving this small problem. So you use the work to pull them in and the coach mm. takes it as high in the organization as it needs to go. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, John. Uh, there's no question here from uh, Suzanne. Do you view the pandemic as an opportunity or barrier to significant change within the management of healthcare? 
I think that I think the pandemic is a huge opportunity. I think it's a huge opportunity because we've gone through a period of tremendous stress. And I don't think anybody wants to do this again. I know. And I think it really has, uh, it, it's a good chance to open senior leaders' eyes to being able to do this. The other thing is, no, not everybody can do this on the senior leadership side, but in my experience, there's always an angel up there. I call them the angel. <laughs> there's somebody up there who's willing to kind of spread their wings around something that's different. And it's making it safe for them to be able to do this is a big part of our work. We can do the frontline work. It just always happens. It's, uh, it, it's actually identifying those people and making it easy and safe for them to say, oh, yeah, we can do this. Just one unit, one place, one thing. Yeah, let's try it. Yeah. That makes sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um... There have been, you know, it's, uh, from organizations I've talked to, um, there are, including some kind of customers, there are some, many, it's hard to put a percentage on it, organizations in healthcare that were very uh, adaptive, if you will. They were agile during the first waves of the pandemic of responding to these new situations and setting up uh, high volume testing sites and then um, solving the challenge around needing more bed capacity and then setting up um, really efficient high volume vaccinations. Like there are many organizations that would point back to previous years of continuous improvement as giving them this great foundation to solve problems that were being thrown at them, uh, both, both large and small. Then there are a lot of organizations that maybe didn't have that background and you know they kind of fell into maybe what you would call Kata One. Um, command center of like, if we just issue the commands more quickly, good results will follow. And I, I appreciate that you're challenging that and you've learned from others, um, you know, uh, General McChrystal and teams of team, team of teams emphasizes the military's learning of it. It's not just about communicating better orders more quickly. It's about engaging people and um, adapting. So um I'm going to try to find the comment in my or the uh, the question in my rambling comment there, but there are some really old <laughs> habits here around. Here, here's the question I was trying to get to in my head. There are really long-standing habits here of this Kata one, top-down, well-intended kind of um, decision making. Um, it's just it's 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 and 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 leaders will try this over and over again, and then some. Uh, unfortunately, maybe blame the employees for poor execution instead of stepping back and challenging the model. Um, I guess I'll just. Uh, what are, what are your yeah, thoughts? Actually, and, uh, you're you're exactly right. No, I mean it's you're exactly right, and it's the way the human brain is designed to work. And again, that's been a big part of our my research. It'd be very interesting. We can do a webinar on that. Actually, mm -hmm. um, sure. That space that you saw that that six week to three month space, that's really important because um, you can't just have this deluge down on you. What we want to do is expand everyone's capacity to be able to manage complex, unpredictable circumstances. You can't do that by just dumping them in a place, but you progressively take them through that space and. The, the six week time frame to uh, start uh, really effectively problem solving has been very predictable. Mm. And if you think about it, how long how long is basic training when you go in the army? It's six weeks. And how long is basic training if you're going to go to the Naval Academy and be an officer? It's three months, but it's that time frame. So creating that space for it, for it to happen. Mm -hmm. in, a, in, an or, in an organization um, is important. And that's, that's the nature of this work. And the leadership kata is designed to do that. It's designed to progressively give people problems that they can solve at a more, uh, and then increase the complexity of the problem. Yeah. And as you're teaching executives, I, I, I know you're not suggesting the executives swoop into the front line and solve problems, but how do you help executives identify problems in the realm of their work that they can work on? 
that they can practice does it for us that's that's really important so um we say to any staff person when you don't have what you need uh or doctor when you don't have what you need to meet the needs of this patient uh, ideally now and we have a very clear criteria for ideal you raise your hand and say i, I have a problem i I can't do this. That's pulling the and on cord. Right. If you want to call it that way. And so you people, and as you get adept at doing that, people are more and more ready to do that. But those are the most of those problems can be handled at the front line, but some of them can't. Some of them have to go to the director level or the CNO level, and some need to go to the CEO level. But they're specific and small i mean the the emergency department you know the the patient arriving from the ed uh uh without uh without any notification of the room is a classic that's probably got to go up to who's ever over the ed and these hospitals so the pro the problems rise but they're manageable there's something that they can kind of hold in their hand and they're specific and that's where the skill sets develop uh, one of the questions might be our last question. Uh, Pierre asked, is the scientific thinking approach rolled out using the starter kata? Um, do you use visual boards in the workplace, daily coaching sessions, et cetera? We use a little different approach than the, than the, than the, than the traditional kata approach. And um, uh, I, I think it's a direct natural extension of the, of the traditional kata approach, but it really goes into a, a new place in which you are developing the people in the organization that are going to, be, going to be doing this, and they are going to be the ones who are going to be making the solutions. So um, you can, uh, it, it does extend into a new place to start this work. Um, uh, but I think it's a very generative new place and it's not a big jump. The big jump comes from trying to change some of these habits, you know, final comment I'll add. I mean, you, you talked about these societal challenges, John, of from a U.S. standpoint, trying to address healthcare costs. And we see how the data points on that curve uh, just diverged over time. The rate of um, increase in, in US healthcare costs far exceeds the rate of increase in uh, other countries. And uh, that, that tendency to keep trying the Kata One type solutions, um, there's parallels, you know, I think to organizations continually trying different Kata One type approaches, but maybe that we can explore this in a future webinar. This seems to come down to whether you describe it as human nature or uh, neuroscience, these, 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 I mean, there's, there's a reason for this commonality, I guess. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's exactly right. And uh, human nature and neuroscience are kind of uh, two, the very, uh, you know, the, the very similar things. And uh, we need space to unload. One of a very, very, very influential person in my, uh, uh, my thinking is a, 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 an elder physician. He said, the reason the reason managers and executives uh, uh, have a hard time doing this, it's, it's the Kubler-Ross cycle. They never have a chance to grieve. And uh, uh, what we do is instead of having to grieve a huge loss, we just give people a chance to see, oh, I'm kind of part of this problem. Well, I can fix that. But now it's in their hands and uh, uh, under their direction, and they're all using and they're all following the rules. That's why spear and bones rules are so mm -hmm. very important in doing this work. Yeah, uh, the rules in use, and I'll encourage people go find it. It's free. You can find the article "Decoding the DNA of the Toyota Production System." Steve Spear, Kent Bowen, and I'm I'm glad John that they've been such an influence on on you. So I, again, I want to thank our presenter. Uh, Dr. John Kanegi. Um, I will take you up on that offer. We'll do another webinar together again at some point. I see some feedback coming in in the chat that it was a great presentation. And I will uh, mirror that second sentiment. I will stumble over my words and say, John, thank you for doing this today. Well, it's been my pleasure. And I, I really, uh, I really, 
I really relish the idea of being able to connect with the lean community through Kata. I think it's a huge, I think it's a huge opportunity. Suzanne, thanks you as well. So um, thank you everybody for attending or thank you for watching or listening uh, to the recording. Um, we'll, we'll see you future webinars.